thank you. It's, uh, I'm going to stand down here because I think the likelihood of me falling off the stage is unusually high if I pace around too much. Uh, I'll talk today about a series of projects that involve experiment and theory. Uh, the experiment was uh, mostly done while I was uh, a postdoc at NIST in the ion storage group, and I'm presently setting up a new uh, experimental group at uh, the University of Sydney as part of the Center for Engineered Quantum Systems, and I'll just acknowledge the variety of funding sources we have. Uh, I'll give generally uh, a talk that follows this outline uh, a very, very brief bit of motivation. I think this, this group doesn't need very much. Uh, and then talk about this concept of quantum firmware for error suppression at the physical level. I think that kind of gives away the show, but I'll speak a little bit more about uh, exactly what I'm thinking. Uh, and then move on to uh, a few different uh, more technical topics. First, the idea of noise filtering, which I've described as an experimental friendly uh, analytical approach. Moving on to some demonstrations of quantum firmware in the lab, dynamical error suppression, and then uh, noise filtering in non-trivial gates, which is a new extension uh, beyond some of the work that's existed uh, previously. So, I mean, this is familiar to everybody, the idea that we're concerned primarily about the effects of environmental noise, uh, unwanted degrees of freedom that are coupled to our system. These are effectively terms that are Hamiltonian that we can't write down or that we don't know. Uh, and from an experimentalist perspective, we generally talk about some coherence times. Uh, but from the perspective of quantum error correction, which is maybe more interesting to this audience, we can think about how these times, in a very rough way, give rise to some lower bounds on the kinds of error rates, p, error probabilities, that we can achieve. And we see that they're generally bounded from below by some op operation time relative to the coherence time. And this is a very rough approximation, and we'll see that it doesn't uh, uh, hold up under most circumstances, but it is kind of the motivation for suppressing the effects of uh, decoherence in our system. And so how we deal with these errors, uh, there are some fun things that are funny. Uh, how we deal with these errors comes from a couple of different techniques that we've heard quite a lot about in the introductory talks yesterday and, and today. Uh, of course, there's the closed loop version, uh, quantum error correction, where we involve measurement and feedback. But I'll be interested in, in speaking about open loop control, uh, dynamical error suppression strategies. And open loop means we don't use measurement and feedback in the great canonical example, or a canonical example to my mind, is the sprinkler system. It comes on every day at a set time. It doesn't measure whether the grass is wet. It doesn't measure whether it's rained. It just comes on, and it actually works pretty well. Most lawns uh, survive with this kind of system. And the aim of the work I'll talk about today is to incorporate these open loop control protocols into a more general setting uh, where we ultimately wish to improve the performance of quantum error correction uh, by driving down physical error rates. Right? That's our main motivation. So uh, I'll, I'll run through this in, in 10 seconds or less. Uh, we know that this is all based on the spin echo, where we talk about using originally in the context of uh, magnetization vectors. Hahn in 1950 showed this in nuclear magnetic resonance. But then dynamical error suppression and dynamical decoupling for the protection of quantum memory has emerged by taking these spin echoes and chaining them together into sequences in order to suppress errors at longer times. Uh, and really, the beauty in, in this kind of application is that there's so much flexibility in how we do the quantum control, what control we use, how many pulses, if we use pulses at all, pulse timing, the kinds of pulses, as I said. Uh, and all of the art, uh, maybe it's a black art even, is in uh, the sequencing, how we chain these quantum control operations together to achieve some desired outcome. And for the duration of this talk, I'll be talking generally about pulsed control, uh, mainly because it's what's been uh, studied primarily in the literature uh, for the last 10 years or so. Uh, but uh, there are obviously many other approaches you can take. For instance, continuous control that uh, Gershon Kariski's group has looked at quite a bit. So that I wish to uh, convey to you is this notion of developing dynamical error suppression strategies as quantum firmware. Uh, I admit it's cutesy, but uh, I think it does, in fact, capture uh, some real concepts. First is the idea that this is a very efficient and simple approach to suppressing errors uh, at the physical level. Uh, it's very easy uh, in the scheme of things compared to many of the quantum error correction, topological quantum error correction and, and whatnot, uh, to implement. And from a system level perspective, we can very easily think about absorbing this into a, into a kind of machine language where uh, uh, it's abstracted away and the programmer of your quantum computer or even your algorithm designer has no idea that this is going on uh, in the background. Uh, but it's also useful to note that this is uh, potentially important, as uh, Remond was uh, speaking about earlier, for kind of any quantum technology. It doesn't have to be quantum computation that uses this. We would, I would generally argue that most things that 
wish to exploit uh, quantum coherence in some way fit from this kind of protection against error. And so this quantum firmware can be useful in a, a variety of settings. But back to quantum computation, uh, if you start worrying about, well, how difficult it is to do all these things in the background uh, of a quantum computer, it's useful to know that there is already a precedent for this, and it exists in pretty much every laptop, or I'm sure every laptop, uh, in this room, and that's the idea of DRAM. DRAM works. Uh, it stores information by charging a capacitor. Each cell is one resistor and one capacitor. And over time, the charge on that capacitor leaks off. It physically migrates off the capacitive trench into the substrate. So roughly once every millisecond, you perform what's called a RASCAS sequence, a row access strobe, column access strobe. You apply a voltage pulse, open loop control, and you refresh all the spins, all the, uh, uh, not spins, all the charges in your system. Right? This kind of firmware exists, and the only impact it has is at the um, uh, level, level for programmers is that it induces some latency. Right? You have to wait until these refreshes are done, but otherwise you don't know about it. I mean, you don't worry about refreshes as you access memory, and the concept that I'm wishing, uh, I'm trying to convey to you is similar here. So my interests, my group's interests, are really in taking these high-level concepts and making them uh, uh, useful. Uh, the first is making these dynamical error suppression strategies more accessible. And for those of you at the ARM meeting, I, ap I apologize. This is a recycled joke, but it got a good response there. And, and it is, in fact, true. Uh, I really don't like when people talk about group theory to me because I don't understand it. Uh, the idea, then, is using this accessibility in how we interpret these dynamical error suppression strategies and using them to calculate real error rates. Instead of assuming some p that's abstract, Let's calculate what P is based on real environmental noise. Let's consider realistic constraints, as Lorenzo was discussing yesterday, imposed by hardware. And let's take these constraints into consideration when we try and design quantum control approaches to suppress uh, errors. So first, I want to speak about this technical topic of noise filter. So if you want to understand how some environmental noise is going to impact your qubit, you can start off this way. We'll take some Hamiltonian that has an unperturbed qubit splitting and then a classical random variable beta of t where beta just captures the noise. And before the theorists in the audience pounce on me and argue how this is uh, insufficiently general, uh, that is a true statement. But it turns out from an experimentalist perspective, this simple Hamiltonian of just sigma z noise, dephasing noise, actually captures almost everything we care about. There are very few circumstances in which it doesn't. Uh, and in fact, even kind of the most quantum mechanically, uh, uh, well, the system most expected to be fully quantum mechanical in its interaction with the bath, that is the central spin problem, is actually better modeled uh, by this kind of Hamiltonian where you assume a fluctuating Overhauser field in single triplet qubits than by the detailed model of a spin interacting with a, a, a sea of spins. So this is where we start. And then you can say over time you end up with some accumulation of phase. That's the error in your system in the rotating frame. If you apply some dynamical error suppression, which involves a series of pulses, as we heard about, uh, you can calculate what the net error is at the end by taking this nasty convolution of this time fluctuating beta of t and this control sequence, and you can try and calculate that phi. You can do it, but it's certainly not intuitive as an approach to understand uh, what kind of error you get. Uh, and it's, it's pretty nasty mathematically. What's really nice is that we can exploit the fact that a convolution of the control in the time domain with the noise gives us a product in the Fourier domain. And this was shown by many people, and I'm sure NMR did this 60 years ago. Uh, but Jurig uh, and Chewinski wrote a few papers a few years ago that were really lovely in, uh, in, in calling out these relationships uh, quite exp And effectively taking any arbitrary sequence and writing down uh, in the Fourier domain what's called now the filter function. This is a spectral function that defines the action of your control sequence. So if we have some noise that's characterized in the lab statistically by a power spectrum, a power spectral density. This is arbitrary. I just pulled this off, off the web. Uh, this is what we have to worry about. It's what we want to suppress. So if we make our sequence by modifying the locations of the pulses in our, in our control such that it filters out the parts of the noise power spectrum that are large, you suppress errors. Right? This is the simple way it works. And you can write this down in terms of uh, a coherence function w, which is an exponential of this chi of t, where chi is this integral, a product of s, the noise, and f, which describes the action of your control sequence. It's that straightforward. And coherence is preserved so long as this filter function is small, where the noise is large. 
Now, you can take these filter functions and calculate them uh, using this analytic, an analytical formula uh, numerically for an arbitrary pulse sequence. And then you can analyze the action of that filter function, or you can analyze the filter function and then interpret its, uh, its effect using graphs like this. This is the filter function on a log log plot as a function of frequency in some dimensionless units. And there are a few characteristics that, uh, that are important to call out. The first is around zero frequency, uh, that is low f uh, uh, in the low frequency limit, there is some slope to how this filter function increases. And it can be shown rigorously that this slope entirely captures the order of error suppression that we talk about in perturbative expansions. So the more steep this is, the better the order of error suppression. We can then talk about things from filter design theory in electrical engineering or in uh, digital signal processing, where we talk about the uh, 3 dB point of our filter. Where does it start to turn on? What's the stop band? What region of space does it prevent? And what region of frequency uh, space does it pass? All these things from a very simple uh, uh, mathematical formalism, and it's important to note that these filter functions uh, are always high pass because if things fluctuate very rapidly compared to the interpulse time as we heard, then the noise gets through unimpeded and you don't do well with these sequences. Now this is nice to me because I can now understand the action of an arbitrary control sequence by examining this thing that I can calculate in a way that's very similar to the way that I choose electronics. When I go to mini circuits, I don't calculate overlap integrals. I look at the filter response of a high pass filter. And I say, well, OK, this has a 3 dB point at roughly the frequency I care about, because I have some noise at 10 megahertz. And it's sufficiently uh, low. This is uh, 80 dB of suppression that this is uh, the right filter for me. I can do the same thing now in a quantum control setting. And what's really nice about this is, in addition to just a simple analytical approach to compare sequences, we can also get some information that doesn't come out quite so explicitly. For instance, uh, the Urig dynamical decoupling sequence is, is really very interesting, and I'll talk about this more in a, in a few minutes. Uh, but in addition to the price that uh, Daniel called out yesterday in terms of the number of qubits, there are other prices. For instance, in order to make this sequence behave as expected, because the pulse locations are irrational, you need infinite precision in order to do the sequencing. And if you start to impose things like clock periods, that you can only define the location of a pulse with a certain precision, you see that the filter function, which is very steep here, meaning that noise in this re regime is, is suppressed very strongly, starts to creep up. And as the precision is reduced, the uh, effectiveness of this sequence gets squashed. Right? So this is revealed just by the numerics of the filter function. And I can understand it just by looking at this, much the same way I select filters in an electric setting. So in order to deal with that, uh, there was a, a study that uh, we started with uh, Lorenza and Dave Hayes and Kabe Kojaste, uh, looking at sequences that we call digital modulation sequences, whereby we no longer rely on these irrational locations for pulses, but instead uh, impose a constraint that all pulses occur with interpulse periods, some multiple of a minimum period or a clock period. And what we caught onto was this idea of the Walsh functions. These are a family of, of square waves, uh, uh, square wave analog of the sines and cosines in some respects. Uh, and this, this family of functions that uh, were studied a lot in the 1970s uh, for uh, communications uh, turned out to be really interesting because each function, which is a square wave in some form, can be affiliated or associated directly with the control propagator for a dynamical decoupling sequence. The transitions correspond to pulse locations in a kind of diagram that's familiar if you uh, are in this uh, uh, body of literature. But it has a variety of benefits. Uh, it's digitally compatible. These sequences are extremely easy to generate. Each one of them, even though they look funny, uh, can be generated just by multiplying together periodic square waves, which is great because it's compatible with very simple digital control electronics. Uh, in hardware, you don't need a full microprocessor to do the sequencing. It's a very nice unified mathematical framework with all sorts of benefits. For instance, these red curves that I've called out here are concatenated dynamical decoupling. They are the CDD traces of different orders that pop out immediately from the Walsh uh, family of, of, uh, of sequences. And there are many others that are of interest. If you want to hear more about this, you should see Kaveh Kojaste's talk uh, on Thursday. So I'd encourage you to come to that or ask me questions afterwards. So what about doing this in the lab? What about really doing experiments? So our experimental uh, platform is a crystal of trapped ions. Uh, each blue dot here is a single beryllium ion. And they fluoresce at about 313 nanometers, which uh, 
we can realize use some high precision laser systems. When we laser cool them using a simple Doppler cooling, they crystallize into these nice arrays. The crystal structure has been studied extensively uh, in the 90s and early 2000s, and, and anybody who's interested in the system can ask me more. For the sake of time, I won't go into it very much. Uh, these are in a penning trap, which is a slightly different kind of trap than you may be used to in ion traps. It's certainly different than uh, what uh, Reiner will talk to you about to, uh, uh, tomorrow. Uh, but the generalities are, are similar. We get some three-dimensional charged particle confinement uh, using electric and, in this case, magnetic fields. And then we use the level structure of the trapped ions as uh, a means to realize a quantum mechanical manifold. So this is the level structure of beryllium at four and a half tesla, uh, which is used for our trapping. And I'll call your attention to a transition here. It's a pure electron spin flip transition at 124 gigahertz, which is a nasty frequency, but it's something we can control. Uh, and uh, the presence of a uh, strongly allowed cycling transition between uh, the upper state bit manifold and the doublet P3 halves excited state in beryllium, which is used not just for Doppler cooling, but also as a form of projective state selective readout, right? The up state is bright when you shine this laser on it, and the down state is not, so we can measure our qubits uh, in a projective way uh, this way. So if we do quantum control experiments, and I'll skip over a lot of the details of how we do that technically, uh, we can, for instance, do a Ramsey experiment and see that over some time of order milliseconds at the time we were doing these experiments, uh, we get some decay in fringe contrast if we're measuring the population of being in the up state or the down state. And this, of course, is due to some random term in the Hamiltonian, some noise, magnetic field fluctuations, uh, that uh, uh, cause a net decay of coherence. Now, here, T2 is about two and a half milliseconds, and it's pretty straightforward and not at all unexpected that by applying some chains of pulses, these are CPMG, it's multipulse spin echo, we can take that, the data are just compressed here, the bottom scale is expanded, we see that the uh, coherence time can be improved, about 10 times for 10 pulses in this system. And that's, it's fine, it's not very exciting. Uh, but what's more exciting is how well the filter function approach works. So this is now error probability as a function of uh, the length of an experiment for different pulse numbers. It's not four times pi pulses, it's four pi pulses. Uh, the different dots are two different sequences, UDD in, uh, in open markers and CPMG in, in black markers. And uh, What you see, of course, is that as you increase the number of pulses, the coherence stays good longer, low error is good. Uh, and more important, or I should say more important, uh, without the end, what we can do is generate these solid, and, and in this case, dash curves that give us a theoretical fit to our data uh, just using the measured noise power. So this is what we actually measure by putting an antenna into our magnet and measuring the fluctuation. And the analytically defined filter function for our sequence, right, appropriate for CPMG or UDD, and we spit out these curves. And you can see that with only a single free parameter, which is just the strength of the noise because there's an inductance in this in this uh, antenna that we don't know, uh, we get extremely good agreement between uh, data and theory. And in particular, the presence of this funny spur at 153 hertz, which it turns out was due to a chiller three labs down the hall, is entirely responsible for these funny bumps and wiggles that you see at intermediate times. All we've done is taken the overlap integral of the filter function and this measured noise, and we get this kind of agreement, which was very exciting for us. This simple technique works extremely well. Now, we can do some other things. Uh, as you may have seen, we don't get very much of a difference between CPMG and UDD. At the time, we were really interested in demonstrating for the first time that this UDD approach of modifying the filter function for a particular kind of noise, as we heard with a high frequency cutoff that's sharp, uh, can work. And so, in our microwave system and replacing a, a, a stable oscillator with a uh, frequency modulated oscillator, we can generate noise in our system. This is noise in the control with a power spectrum that mimics something of interest, right? So this is one over F with a, well, it's one over omega with a sharp high frequency cutoff. And this is something that looks like omega, uh, ohmic noise. The upshot is we can model the dynamics of other quantum systems and probe in detail uh, the functionality of this Urig approach. And so just very, very quickly, uh, as the noise gets stronger, so this is injected noise in an ohmic setting relative to the background, which is this dashed line. That's the stuff I showed you a few minutes ago. As the noise strength, that's artificial, goes up, the relative performance of CPMG and UDD gets flipped. So this was the first demonstration that this UDD approach, when we have strong high frequency noise, will in fact uh, uh, give a benefit, right? So this worked. It was really kind of nice to us. But we can go much further than that.
Uh, we don't need to stick with things that are defined analytically in some uh, uh, arbitrary and, and idealized way. We can actually do feedback, uh, measurement feedback on autonomous uh, control in order to generate new sequences that are numerically optimized. So what we did here is we, well, this is CPMG and UDD, and then we pick a particular value of, of time. This is the length of our experiment. This is a semi-log butt. And at that point, we start a multi-dimensional numeric uh, Nelder-Mead search algorithm that moves the pulses around relative to one another to find the optimum error uh, at that point. And then we can trace out and we find that we get even better error suppression by doing this numerical optimization. What we're doing is tailoring the filter function of our sequence to the actual measured noise in our system. And here this is injected uh, high frequency noise. So we can do better than UDD. And in this case, these values are uh, uh, kind of meaningless because we're injecting very strong noise to swamp the back. But the upshot is we can uh, do better by these numerical techniques. Now, I wanted to give an interlude because there's been a fair bit of discussion about uh, this UDD sequence. We heard about it yesterday. If you're not familiar, it's an optimized sequence that uh, gives very nice scaling and error in the order of error suppression with the number of pulses. Uh, I've, it was obviously very interested in studying it, but I've come to the conclusion over the past couple years that it's likely uh, to meet its end at some point soon. I don't think it's going to prove to be very useful. The fact that you require this uh, infinite precision in order in, uh, in the pulse sequencing in order to get the benefits, uh, its incompatibility with digital clocking, uh, some other effects uh, uh, really suggest that it may not be the solution that's best tailored to large scale systems. I'm sure it can find uh, some niche applications, but I don't think it's the be all end all that some people uh, anticipated originally. Uh, that doesn't mean it's uh, not useful, but what's really important about the URIG sequence is that let's think about these problems of quantum control in a very different way. URIG's work gave us the filter function, this filter design approach, uh, or the filter function uh, uh, analytical method, uh, and he made us think about pulse timing as a degree of freedom that hadn't really been considered in, in quite as much detail uh, previously. So it's, it's had a, a huge amount of benefit but I personally am not convinced that it's going to have a, a very long future. It may, I may be wrong. Uh, we did a number of studies uh, looking at different kinds of optimization uh, published in a variety of outlets uh, a few years ago, but uh, there's a key point that I wanted to get across, which is why this worked. Uh, in our system it worked because our uh, quantum control had pretty good fidelity. Uh, there was, this was uh, uh, up on one of uh, the slides earlier today that using this crystal and randomized benchmarking, we got to a single cubic gate fidelity of 99.92%. The real big change, um, Manny's original results, was that we moved from laser-mediated gates to microwave-mediated gates. And uh, in this system, again, 124 gigahertz is a pretty nasty place to work. This was pretty good for us. Uh, but uh, it's this very high fidelity that gave us the ability to do these studies without well, measuring quantitatively the effects of environmental noise without measuring just the effects of bad pulses. Right. So what I've told you about so far addresses uh, this gate set by only focusing on, on one operation, that is memory or the identity operator. And what we're really interested in is expanding this general approach, filter design and quantum firmware and quantum uh, control for error suppression towards other things that are of interest to anybody who's looking to apply a universal gate set. Uh, I wanted to mention something briefly. I think the decouple then compute uh, strategy uh, is incomplete in that it ignores what happens during the operations, during the compute part. So I think we need both approaches. We need to worry about the decoupling, and then we need to make these things robust against errors as well. So the key question is how do we actuary, actuate, accurately uh, calculate P for a particular gate in the presence of environmental noise that's often time dependent, and how do we improve Gate error. And this is the subject of uh, some work I'll talk to you about for the next few minutes. It's work done by uh, an extremely talented undergraduate student, uh, Todd Green at Sydney. Uh, and I, I think it will uh, relate to some of the work we'll hear about later today uh, and uh, maybe tomorrow as well. So if you just think about performing some quantum operation that's non-trivial, for instance, a pi over 2 pulse where we go from the North Pole to the equatorial plane in this uh, simple depiction, if we have some non-zero detuning error, this is written in the lab frame, what you find, and this is, this is early quantum mechanics, or, or um, 
uh, uh, first semester quantum mechanics, is that the net effect of that operation give you a rotation about a shifted, uh, tilted axis, and that's incomplete, right? So you perform a, some operation that's not what you wanted. You don't end up on the green dotted line. You end up somewhere over here. But what's important to note there is that a pure dephasing environment, this is just a sigma z error, during a control operation will give you this general depolarization error. You end up off the equatorial plane as well as accumulating a phase. Right? And what becomes really nasty is that if you think about this delta being a function of t, it becomes difficult to treat this analytically. Uh, you're not to, uh, rotating about some fixed tilted axis. It's now an axis that moves in time. Uh, and it's, uh, again, important to note that this is not so abstract as to be useless. This captures a wide variety of environmental sources, but also intrinsic sources that we have to start worrying about when we think about uh, error rates at the fault tolerance level. The most important of those is instability in the master oscillator. Phase noise in a master oscillator is manifest as this kind of z noise delta of t, right? Your, the frequency of your oscillator is changing in time in a, in a, in a statistical way. So what we use in order to address this problem is effective Hamiltonian theory. It goes back to some work from Lorenzo and Manny years ago where uh, we take this Hamiltonian, and I apologize, I've again changed notation now, it's eta of t for the noise, and we can write down an effective Hamiltonian and a, a, a control propagator, or excuse me, a propagator, that looks like uh, the effect of a time-independent average Hamiltonian instead of a nasty time-dependent Hamiltonian. And these are some technical details of how we do it, such that if we wish to implement some gate, O, some operation O, uh, you write down the total uh, propagator for it, uh, as O times some error. So this exponential captures the error. And if you have questions about this, you can, you can grab me afterwards. The question then is, can we apply this to some non-trivial gate and calculate the effect on the fidelity of no during this gate? So yes, we can. We use the trace fidelity. We get something that looks uh, like an exponential of these terms here, which are the subscript L are the Cartesian coordinates. So these are the uh, parts of the, uh, or the uh, terms that are proportional to Pali operators x, y, and z, such that our average fidelity in the presence of this environmental noise is given by a form that looks very reminiscent to this calculation I did before where the coherence is e to the minus chi of t and chi is some overlap between noise and a filter function. Well, here is something that after a first order Magnus expansion looks very much like a filter function where each one of these corresponds to x, y, or z. Right? So now, for a non-trivial gate, not just the identity operator, we can write down a filter function that captures the effect of the quantum control and the effect of the noise. So for some uh, uh, class of, of sequences that are of interest, uh, this is a subset of what we can do. We can apply this to arbitrary modulation. But uh, it's useful to think about sequences where we can apply some arbitrarily chosen rotation rate and some arbitrarily chosen rotation axis, but we just apply the uh, constraint that each segment of our piecewise defined control gives us a pi pulse. Right? You apply a pi pulse, you apply a pi pulse about a different axis. Uh, dynamical decoupling is captured here because you do pi pulses about x and then two pi pulses in a row about z, it's an identity operator. So these piecewise defined control functions uh, capture a broad class of things that are of interest. So What's nice is we can write down using this closed form solutions of the filter function. Uh, you can write down filter functions analytically for, again, any sequence, but it's neater if you make this uh, uh, requirement. Uh, and they have some more terms uh, that I can, again, explain to anybody who's interested. But what's very important is that not only do we have a filter function for the effect of dephasing, we now have a filter function. There's the effects of polarization damping, the buildup of x and y and or y errors. Uh, in our system when we're applying control in the presence of dephasing noise. Right? And it's, it's nice mathematically that if you look at the prefactors here, they look uh, very reminiscent to what you expect from a uh, master equation treatment of a driven harmonic oscillator in the presence of some uh, damping. Uh, it's kind of as expected. We're doing a driven rotation in the presence of some dissipation, and of course these are uh, important only in the uh, statistical ensemble. So what can we do with this? Well, we can treat a couple different uh, non-trivial gate constructions that are of interest. Of course, there's the simple trivial gate. There's a pi pulse. And then there's the dynamically corrected gate, 
This is what uh, Lorenzo told us about yesterday, where you have a series of pi pulses and then pi pulses that go in the other direction. So it's just changing the phase of your oscillator. And then at the end, there's a that just takes twice as long and is half as large in amplitude. But it's all just pi pulses. So we can use this filter function approach that I told you about a moment ago and try and analyze the performance of these things. Because while the general performance has been studied in a perturbative approximation uh, from uh, previous work by Lorenza and Cave, I swear to God that when I look at Cayley graphs, my mind starts spinning. And uh, uh, I think this filtering approach is, uh, is, as a experimentalist, a little more straightforward. So here are the filter functions for the simple pi pulse and the DCG gate. Black is the pi pulse, the primitive, and red is the DCG. So what do you see? The order of error suppression is improved in the filter because the slope of the filter near zero frequency is enhanced in the DCG. If you look at the high frequency regime, there is an effect of extended time. This thing is six times longer than the simple gate operation. That means that if you have lots of noise up here, uh, it's dimensionless scale, that you're going to get hurt. It makes sense. If you make your gate longer, anything that fluctuates on the time scale that's extended is uh, not going to influence the primitive gate as strongly, right? So that's captured here. But then the effect of dynamic protection comes in here, where the uh, uh, order of the error suppression is enhanced using this simple dynamic approach. And I won't talk about this, but that talks about the different quadratures. You can uh, now calculate the error uh, as a, uh, the probability of error in total. So what's the total probability you're not where you expect it to be, but also what's the probability you've ended up uh, having an X error versus a Z error. And we can validate this using some brute force numerics. This is error probability as a function of time in some dimensionless units for a particular kind of noise environment. Uh, and the solid and the dashed lines are the calculations using this filter design approach, where we write down the filter functions and just take the overlap integral with the noise. And then the data points are the expect or outcomes of these detailed simulations where you trace the block vector over the block sphere, and then you average over many iterations. And we get very good agreement within about 10 or 15 or 20 percent. Uh, and remember, this is a logarithmic scale here, so 20 percent error is, is very small. Uh, and frankly, I don't care, and I don't think anybody here cares if the error is 2 by 10 to the minus 4 or 2.1 by 10 to the minus 4. They care about the 10 to the minus 4, right? So this filter design approach, even though it's first order Magnus expansion, uh, really captures a lot of what we care about from a practical perspective. So what comes next? Uh, well, this was the microwave system that we used at 124 gigahertz. It's really nasty. It's custom made. Uh, all these oscillators are involved. Uh, and all we can do with it is on-off pulsing. It's pretty restricted. Uh, we can replace that now by moving to a lower uh, magnetic field and a lower frequency with a box from Agilent that's uh, it's expensive, but it does programmed uh, vector IQ modulation. So we can do amplitude, phase, frequency control. And this gives us a new wide range of capabilities to perform dynamically corrected gates and new kinds of continuous control that we've not uh, previously studied. And using these filter design approaches, we think we can do optimization as well. So here's the summary of my talk. Uh, I hope I've convinced you of this, the utility of this concept of quantum firmware and how we can develop new analytical approaches for noise filtering that capture the average effects very well. Uh, without doing detailed time domain calculations. We can treat things that vary in time using this average Hamiltonian theory. Uh, filtering during gate operations is now something we can do. And I think we'll hear about it in one of the talks in a few minutes. Uh, and uh, we've done a variety of experimental demonstrations at a small scale, but started to now consider what happens if we want to move to something bigger. What happens if we think about constraints, uh, as again, Lorenzo talked about yesterday, that have not uh, traditionally been of concern. At the lab, I can do my sequencing perfectly well using a, an FPGA or a programmable logic device in a PC. But if I want to build something bigger, I need to worry about a different set of constraints. And again, quantum computing isn't the only application. Uh, I wanted to acknowledge the collaborators, in particular Todd Green, who did the second half of uh, the work I talked about today, uh, plug the quantum firmware collaboration, which has been very fruitful for me. And I've been uh, very pleased to collaborate with Lorenza and Cave and Amir. Uh, and then do a little bit of smarmy advertising about what a nice place it is uh, to live in Sydney and, and uh, invite uh, anybody who's interested to come and talk to me. So thanks for your attention. OK, very nice. Uh, questions? It's either good or bad. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Ah, they're trying to make me exercise. Um, so, strong proponent of this filter function viewpoint. So, um, it works very well for this limited class of models of um, classical dephasing noise. If your noise is more general than that, if you have spin flip noise, et cetera, then you don't just have one filter function. In principle, you have a filter function for every element of a chi matrix or something like that. I just wonder if you have any comments since you're going down this road kind of hard on, on whether that's going to be fruitful when the noise is more general. Sure. So the, I guess there's two parts to that. Uh, first, I, well, there's three parts, I guess. We, we showed, first of all, you can write down filter functions that capture the average effects of uh, errors during, if I ever get there, during control operations in the x and y, so the amplitude quadrature. So this general approach can work for characterizing statistical errors. Uh, doing this more generic, or an error model that explicitly accounts for T1, that's something tougher, but you have to keep in mind that most T1 processes are not reversible. If it's spontaneous emission, it doesn't matter, right? So you just have some error probability, and this sets a different bound. Uh, if it's a coherent rotation error, um, that's something uh, a little bit different, and you can start to consider, I think, uh, writing down filter functions for that. But again, I'm just going to emphasize that this classical dephasing model captures almost everything we care about. And if you have some other uncorrectable error coming from T1, you can just add that on top. Uh, any other questions? I should have just stayed back there. I have the question. It looks like you have a huge dynamical range because uh, your coherence time is milliseconds and you're working at 100 gigahertz. Uh, uh, did I, did well, I understand it correctly? So in principle, yes. Uh, uh, it's a 124 gigahertz carrier in that particular experiment. In the new ones, it's, it's 28. Mm -hmm. uh, what matters is how long it takes to do the control, so it's the Rabi time. Uh, in those experiments, it was, it was tens of microseconds, and we can get that down now to tens or hundreds of nanoseconds, but you know, the range is more limited than, than it first mm -hmm. appears. So actually, all this stuff which happens uh, at the edges of the pulse and all the errors associated with the pulse shaping, it's not a concern for you, right? It has absolutely not been a concern. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay, well, why don't we have the next speaker set up. Any other questions? And let's thank Mike again. There's two considerations.